Did you ever think after four Arkham games as Batman that the next game in this lofty universe would be the Captain Boomerang game? Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is finally here, unless you've been living under a kryptonite rock the past four years since its initial announcement in 2020, you'll know that this game has become more and more the butt of the joke the more that's been unveiled. Studio Rocksteady were once considered superhero gaming gods, and it felt like after the Arkham Trilogy they could do no wrong. It has been truly upsetting as a fan to see the trust and goodwill erode as this Suicide Squad game revealed itself. Everybody wanted them to do a Superman game, nobody wants more live service from them, or really any studio. In spite of giving us three awesome single player games, in spite of the single player Spider-Man games selling like hotcakes, Rocksteady and WB are giving us a co-op looter shooter that promises lots of expensive cosmetics and free story content down the line in the hope that we'll be playing for hundreds of hours. I think everybody is aware that no one is going to be playing it for that long, but does that mean it should get a negative review? Well, not necessarily. Although I've also had my hype dampened by several factors in the lead up to this game, I was looking forward to getting three other friends alongside me to battle the league on launch day. The gameplay looked fun, if repetitive. The story looked engaging, if uninspired. I did also think there was a part of the audience for this game that did just start sh** on it because it became the cool thing to do. Herd mentality is of course the name of the game on the internet, and I think that works both ways. Especially with products that have huge obsessive fandoms attached, you'll find things will either go one of two extreme ways. People will be praising the thing, calling it the second coming, or hating on it like it ran over their family dog. Any criticism either way is often completely squished until six months later when people finally get brave enough to rear their heads and suddenly Twitter gets into a frenzy like, oh, where were you people when the thing came out? And you know, you weren't being critical then, except they were, they were just getting stamped out by the, the, the extremism of fandom. Anyway, oftentimes these sentiments will become entrenched before the film or game, or what have you, has even come out, and it is exhausting. So in spite of a mixture of emotions, I try to go into Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League with an open mind and just try it. I'm going to break down the surprisingly good, the not so surprisingly bad, and the very, very ugly. I'm going to be looking at this as a gamer, a lifelong fan of the Batman Arkhamverse, and the DC Universe itself. So strap in, hear what I think about this game, and then be sure to tell me what you think in the comments below. Was it a swing and a miss? Overrated? Underhated? Did the Suicide Squad get what they deserve? Did Suicide Squad kill the Arkhamverse? <laughs> How did we get here? Well in 2009, little known developer Rocksteady made a splash with Batman Arkham Asylum. Game director Sefton Hill stated in a Reddit AMA that before that point, publishers didn't see much value in a Batman game. They didn't even think it would be as huge as it was until they showed a demo to Eidos who ended up calling in about 50 people from the offices just to watch. Before Arkham Asylum, superhero games and licensed tie-in games in general were often shoddy rushed affairs. But the first Arkham wasn't just a good license game, it was an amazing game full stop. Anything you'd want to be able to do as Batman in a single location, you could. It was bolstered by the GOATs, the late great Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill, Paul Dini on writing duties. It had a polish and a love behind it that felt unheard of in that space. Do you really think you can win? 2011's follow-up Arkham City improved upon the mechanics in just about every way, added in more villains and gave us a huge detailed space to roam around in. 2015's Arkham Knight was Rocksteady's conclusion and it was unfairly bashed in my opinion. I don't even mind the abundance of Batmobile, it still had the incredible Arkham combat, the Predator stealth, the detective elements, it was moody and dark and surprising, and all in all, a worthy successor to the first two games. They stand as an incredible example of what superheroes can be in video games, they're some of my favourite games ever, and they solidified Rocksteady as the guys that could pull off a proper superhero experience. The Arkhamverse felt like a perfect representation of Batman, drawing from the comics, the animated series, and the movies to form this heightened amalgamation of everything we loved about the Caped Crusader. For me personally, and I'm sure for many others, the developer created trust. Trust that they knew this DC world and how to adapt it. But the actual inception of this Suicide Squad game came in 2013's prequel, Arkham Origins, which contained a post credit stinger for a Suicide Squad game. 
WB Games Montreal reportedly worked on a Suicide Squad game until 2016, but that was supposedly canned and WB got Rocksteady to work on the comics property from the ground up, which may go some way in explaining why it took 9 years for us to see a game from them again. It also makes me wonder if the creative force at Rocksteady really wanted to do this in the first place. Now this stroll down memory lane isn't just to show the disparity between these three masterpieces by Rocksteady and the new game, I also wanted to talk about a strong theme running throughout the series. Death. The death of the Joker is a huge moment in the Arkham series, perhaps the very biggest. Not only was it a shocking ending to Arkham City, not only was it a change that stuck where a lesser series would have gone straight to resurrection, but the entire third game hinged on it. You got to have your cake and eat it too, because the Joker stayed dead, but he also got to rattle around in Batman's head, taking on a key supporting role as another dead bat staple did return from the grave in Jason Todd. And it all culminated with Batman's last stand against the Joker, locking him away forever ensuring the Clown Prince of Crime's greatest fear would be realised, that he would be forgotten. And in a way, even Batman died, because his identity was revealed to the world. The Scarecrow did this, and it's something that no other Batman villain has ever done. The Arkhamverse wasn't just a perfect adaptation, it took risks as well. Death has surrounded this DC universe because of the Joker's demise in a wholly distinctive and unique way, in a way the movies have never gotten to. Jack Nicholson's Joker goes out like any other crime lord, Ledger's Joker exclaims that they are destined to do this forever, but sadly that could not have been explored down the line, and the lesson about Jared Leto in any context, the better. Here the Dark Knight's greatest enemy, locked in what seemed like an eternal struggle, actually met his end, both in the real physical world and inside Batman's bad psyche. It was epic, it was awesome, there really wasn't much more to be done with this Dark Knight. The promise of the premise. So obviously death has continued to play a big part in the Arkhamverse, but instead of death being a monumental thing that changes the status quo of two of the most beloved comic book characters ever, here death has been used as a salacious marketing gimmick. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League has, for many years, promised that we would do just that. I have to ask, did anybody really have a massive hankering to do that? Was anybody in the DC fandom begging to kill evil versions of this godly superhero team? Sure, Evil Superman was popular for a time, but A, that was truly in vogue about 10 years ago with Injustice, and B, it was done to death there. Nowadays you have Superman proxies like Homelander and Omni-Man that can explore the same ideas effectively, leaving little need in the modern superhero landscape for an evil Superman. And less so, a brainwashed Superman. What made Injustice interesting was the idea that Superman would snap at the hands of the Joker. Here the Justice League have done these terrible deeds against their will. They don't need to be stopped, they need to be saved. But more on that in a bit. I think the game really stuck the developers between a rock and a hard place, because if you call it Kill the Justice League, and you don't kill the Justice League, then that's going to be disappointing, but then if you do kill the Justice League, that's also going to be disappointing. There seems to be no way out here. I don't even think of the Suicide Squad as a team that needs to take on the Justice League. I enjoyed both of the movies dealing with pretty low level alien incursions. I like the Suicide Squad movies leaning into like pretty standard alien invasions and alien body horror, rather than having them taking on characters that were just way above their pay grade. The game kind of gets that half right because there is an alien invasion, but the head of that alien invasion is Brainiac, and I don't think that needed to happen. I think someone like Starro, even though they debuted in a Justice League comic, I think they're perfect for taking on the Suicide Squad. Regardless of the problems with this concept, that's the concept we've been dealt. The Justice League must be stopped by any means necessary. But what about the other eponymous comic book team of this game? What about the... <laughs> The Suicide Squad. When this game was announced, I was baffled by the fact that the main campaign would star just four Suicide Squad members. The fun of the team, something later realised in James Gunn's cinematic adaptation, is the fact that they are expendable. They aren't gods, they rarely even have superpowers. They're just morally dubious crooks, underpowered and outgunned, forced into saving the world. You'd think a DC Games universe that has explored death so well would be more than capable of seeing this translated. But instead, the only characters who don't die are the Suicide Squads. As expected, you take control of these four squadders and they take you through the whole game. Wouldn't this premise have made more sense, a bit more akin to Marvel Ultimate Alliance or X-Men Legends, but with permadeath? What if you started out with 20 squad members, each with varying degrees of power, and you had to use these squad members to complete the campaign? If they die, that's it, 
they're off the board. You're saving the most powerful members for a character like Superman, and then you're saving other characters like Deadshot who have a relationship with Batman, just for different tasks and different specific missions, and you're hoping that you'll come up with a strategy that will allow you to keep as many Suicide Squad members alive for the end game. That would have made it feel like the Suicide Squad's beyond aesthetics. That would have made you feel like Amanda Waller. Of course, the idea doesn't sound too life service friendly now, does it? It is honestly insane to me that we're dealing with playing as mostly non-meta humans fighting Justice League gods, and the whole gimmick with that playable team is that they can die at any moment, and yet, none of them get mashed into pulp. If anything, none of them even seem that threatened by the League. The Force stroll up to characters like brainwashed Superman or The Flash, and they seem to know that they are the main characters. They know that they have all the plot armour, they know there's no way that you can play four player co-op with a three person team, even if they're standing next to a guy that could laser vision them to dust, or the guy that could A train them, the Suicide Squad doesn't really seem to care. You shouldn't have done that, Shark. That's Superman. The only person they're genuinely scared of is Batman. And look, I know it's Batman, but also, what? I'd be wetting my boomer underoos taking on these guys. Oh, and did I mention it's a multiverse game? As if there's not enough of that going around right now. So the premise in its entirety does not feel ideal, either for the Suicide Squad or the Justice League. But this is the game, so how does it play? The gameplay. The biggest gripe about the gameplay that people would not stop going on about during pre-release was the fact that everybody had guns. Honestly, I found it so overblown. When I think about the Suicide Squad, in particular both of the movies, I think of them as gun-toting teams. All the heavy hitters use weapons from Bloodsport to Harley to Rick Flag to Peacemaker to Deadshot to Slipknot, the man who can climb anything. Most of the Suicide Squad are usually regular humans with special gear, and that's true for three out of the four playable characters in the game. Only one is a meta-human, so I'd understand why you'd want more of a melee focus with King Shark, but it's not a deal breaker for me. Everyone loved to make fun of the the fact that Captain Boomerang used guns like loads of comic book characters don't use an assortment of gadgets in their arsenal outside of their theme anyway. Should Batman only use his gliding cape because that's bat-like and toss out the grappling hook? Bats don't use grappling hooks. Eh, Boomer was clearly using his boomerang for traversal in all the previews and really, does anyone care that deeply for a character like Captain Boomerang? Do people outside of Australia love boomerangs that much? or shrimp, or Barbies. I tell a lie, I love Barbies. Barbies are the best. Ugh, mwah. In practice, the abundance of guns works just fine. In spite of having crossover with some of the gun types between characters, everyone feels unique enough to be worthwhile playing. The sound design of the weaponry makes the gunplay feel impactful and satisfying. The enemy types are surprisingly diverse, but I must admit, the samey aesthetics between them don't help the feeling that you're facing a repetitive foe. I thought the counter shot was going to be a really hollow attempt to pander to Arkham fans, because it apes the most famous counter style of that trilogy's awesome combat system, and it took some getting used to, but I actually found it really satisfying to pull off. It added a little something to the gunplay, and it did actually make it feel like it's from the same Bat family as those older games. The secret sauce is really the combination between the gunplay and the traversal, because not only does it make chaining moves together really fun and cool to look at, it's where each character's skill set makes you play differently. Death from above with long range weapons and a jetpack feels unique compared to Boomerang's run and gun, up close and personal style of shotguns and super speed. Harley Quinn being able to swing to and fro and shoot her guns provides a neat tactical advantage, and then when you're after the simple things in life, it's cathartic to super jump and smash down onto targets as the Norway. The thing that's super annoying about this game is it can't help but feel super repetitive. The gunplay and movement demands more exciting and diverse objectives. I like shooting up the baddies with my friends, but I couldn't help but think I would probably have put this down playing alone. If you're going to get this game, it needs to be co-op. I managed to wrangle a full squad and it was some of the most fun I've had with a video game in ages, but that's less to do with the game and more to do with the fact I was laughing my ass off one minute and making tactics the next. The bosses, which I'm going to cover in more detail, were the main thing keeping us all going and the lead up to them broke up the monotony of the regular missions. Rocksteady kept banging on about the fact that the Metropolis map was five times larger than the trio of islands in Arkham Knight, and whilst it is cool to look at, with some unique statues and buildings to mix it up and stop it being a monotonous chore to zip around in, it pales in comparison to that former location. 
I don't go crazy for open worlds, as I think often they can trade quality for size, like all my ex-lovers. You'll have a huge area to mess around in, but the levels can lack character. Arkham Knight was the perfect balance of being large enough that it felt like you had options, you could do what you want, but intimate enough in its level design that it felt like you really got to explore every nook and cranny of the three islands. Funny then that Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League throws out that approach and is instead more in line with what I don't like about open worlds. There's very little to do here and the world doesn't really feel lived in. Sure, Arkham Knight plays on an evacuation to explain away civilians, but both that game and City had a host of engrossing henchmen turning the map into their personal playground. This map loses all of those charms in place of Brainiac's purple nurples. If the League have exaggerated evil personalities, why couldn't we have heard the everyday people trapped inside these transformed zombies giving in to their primal desires and unwittingly enjoying being evil? The League seem to be loving it in their brainwashed state, maybe it would have been interesting to hear from the turned citizens too. Too, if only to give the city a bit more of a voice. There's an alarming lack of interiors, which is expected with a live service model, but even more of a shame whenever you find yourself walking through the Daily Planet or a Metropolis set Batcave. I really wish this had gone for more bespoke level design and more of a story driven approach like the Arkham series. I think it's safe to say a 4 player team up game with the attention to detail of an Arkham game would have sold gangbusters. I don't understand how companies don't seem to get that I'll play Arkham Knight at least once a year, I've racked up hundreds of hours on it across multiple consoles, and yet they think the best way to follow this up is to make it Fortnite. Why the Arkhamverse? When it just comes down to it, the decision to make it part of the Arkhamverse could have been appropriate on paper, as the original games felt like an epic part of an even larger canvas akin to the comic world. But in practice, it just feels hogtied by the decisions that were made. Like having Batman's identity outed, committing to a dead shot, besting the Riddler once and for all only for him to come back to make his annoying little trophies. Fiddle diddle diddle, answer my riddle. Hi diddle diddle. Hubba hubba. <laughs> It just seems strange not to go to another superhero in the Justice League and build out their world the same way you did for Batman, rather than going to the Suicide Squads, but also introducing all of these Justice League members and all these random bits and pieces like Rick Flagg who looks like he came from a CW show. The most mystifying link to the Arkhamverse isn't even Batman, it's Poison Ivy. Why are Roxetti so into this character? She had a main role in two games in the Arkham Trilogy, got to be a villain and then a redeemed hero along with a climactic death. Why bring her back? And you grooted her to boot, bringing her back as a child version with next to no memories of her former self. What was the point? Resurrecting her adds little to the story and I've seen this character so much already. Who am I going to have more of next? The Joker? Ah, oh, for f**k's sake. Deadshot. Speaking of Poison Ivy continuity, why did they go with a new Deadshot? I get that this probably started development long after the Will Smith Deadshot, making Rocksteady lean into an African American version of the character, but the problem is you're setting it in the Arkhamverse, where you already had a white boy version running around in two whole games. I feel like the point of bringing back Deadshot and Harley is so that you can go, hey, I kicked these villains asses, and now I'm playing as them. I don't care if you want to make Deadshot black with a retcon, but the way the game tries to explain it away as the original Arkham City version being an imposter, in spite of going by the name Floyd Lawton and having the same tumultuous relationship to his daughter, that's super, super contrived. Why draw attention to it? Just go with this new version and be done with it, or continue the original character. If there's a lack of black playable characters, would it have been such a stretch to make the only other human character that's previously unseen a black character? And then the game misses the painfully obvious, it's a multiverse story, right? So why the hell couldn't either Deadshot just be from another world? If you have such a hard on for having to explain the change of race for the character, then why the hell wouldn't you lean on the multiverse? Arkhamverse continuity aside, I liked Floyd being the straight man to the others varying degrees of incompetence and insanity. I loved his traversal mechanics, I seriously could not get enough of that jetpack, it was so sweet and it worked really well. You basically get two full charges and you can reset it with a top left bumper, L1 on PS5, and between that, wall running and power sliding, it made zipping around a breeze. I much preferred being able to get height with this traversal over the other characters' mechanics, and the ability to hover in the air and sniper targets never really got old. Harley Quinn. Harley keeps the same voice actor and her backstory is referenced throughout the game, making her feel a little more unified with her Arkham counterpart. However, the biggest distance comes from how this Harley talks about her Joker. It's clear that she sees that he was abusive and controlling and she harbours regrets about her past actions, but this development all takes place off screen and then isn't given any kind of retroactive depth. 
The problem is that when Harley appeared in the original games, she was portrayed as a bit of a moron, more so than she ever was before, and she never showed any inkling of regret, even long after the Joker was dead in Arkham Knight. This new Harley feels more in line with the anti-hero portrayal of the character, which has become much more popular since 2009's Arkham Asylum. It just doesn't really fit to see this character act so differently, and go from being referred to as none too bright by Batman, and beaten very easily. I never was too bright. Get some new material, jerk off. Now she's a combat powerhouse, and even references that Arkham Asylum line about her intelligence. I don't mind the idea of the character evolving, but it's clear that this really is more of a retcon. But how does she play? Yeah, this new Harley is really fun. She has the most Arkham-esque traversal with the added secret source of being able to pick off targets while swaying on her grappling hook. I'd say this is the version of the character across all the games that is the most fun to play, but it's just a shame she feels about as connected to the original games as Deadshot does. King Shark. I found King Shark surprisingly fun to play, considering how meat and potatoes his traversal was. He can actually get across the map really efficiently, combining a super jump with an air dash. The other characters have more nuance, but I found Shark's gameplay refreshingly stripped back, and he probably ended up being my second favourite to play, honestly. I think it's funny how much hardcore Snyder fans like to constantly imply everything superhero related has borrowed from the director, when 10 years after Guardians of the Galaxy we've still got the stylings of that group loud and clear in all kinds of media. King Shark is literally Drax the Destroyer, everything about his on the nose responses and failure to understand sarcasm is ripped straight from that 2014 iteration. We're out on good behaviour. We are not. Ironically, this King Shark is much more like James Gunn's Drax than his actual King Shark. What can I say? It's derivative and shameless, but it works. The Shark Boy did make me laugh, and I enjoyed his personality paired with his smashing gameplay, so go figure. Captain Boomerang. Lo and behold, Captain Boomerang's melee is his boomerang. So after all the smug complaining everyone did, it turns out that he uses his boomerang for close quarters combat and traversal, at which point I don't think it matters at all that he also uses guns. Boomerang looked to have the most interesting and unique traversal in the game, and whilst it does have its charms, I think it ends up being the most disappointing aspect of the character. I like the visual of throwing the boomerang and catching it before it reaches its destination via the speed force, but in practice, it's a little clunky. I feel like you should be able to super run, or at least have it as part of the boomerang mechanic. In terms of his personality, he is the big comic relief character, and the only one that truly feels like a villain. I must admit, a lot of his lines that seemed annoying in the trailers played a lot better in the main game, and I thought he was really entertaining. The fastest man alive, according to all these girlfriends. They're talking about you, boy. The Flash. Fit check. What the hell did they do to The Flash's outfit? It looks horrendous. Not only is it too armoured, it's barely got enough red going on, and that helmet, those lenses, the wings, god, it's honestly gopping. Bottom of the barrel costuming for the Flash, and I think it actually hurt his presence in the game, because every time I see him, I get irritated by the fact that he looks this ridiculous. It doesn't even feel like an Arkham style Flash. The earliest Batman suits were more form fitting and cloth based. Why couldn't we have had something simpler here? Anyway, The Flash has some fun moments, why don't you just mail me the bullet being a particular highlight, and he certainly spurs on some of Boomerang's funniest moments. I like that he meets the player before he's been captured, so that we get a little bit of his true self on screen, but other than that, there's really not too much to say about him story-wise. He's the first one to go. The boss battle... I really enjoyed this. My teammates all agreed and thought it felt appropriate to the character without it being stupidly difficult. I have liked Destin Legary since the Screw Attack days, but that IGN preview was seriously whack. No, the flash isn't too fast to hit. If anything, I think the game finds a good balance between making him really elusive but still satisfying to shoot. It was also pretty awesome when he starts dropping tornadoes all about the shop and the fight gets really crazy. It was also a fun little detail to have Boomerang stripped down to his tighty whities in a hilarious twist. The MacGuffin to combat the speedster is developed by Lex, so it doesn't really feel super contrived, but it does stretch credulity every time the Flash doesn't just burst right through Task Force X. Overall, I'd hate to ever have to see the Flash in this look, but character-wise and boss battle-wise, it does the job. Green Lantern. Fit check. Jon Stewart's outfit is perfect. No notes. I love how the green on the outfit looks like the actual constructs. 
a better way of trying to do what they were going to do for the Reynolds edition. His boss battle comes after the flash and you utilize yellow lantern batteries to give the team an edge, which makes sense and feels accurate to the comics. I really enjoyed seeing the green meanie make a larger version of himself and his constructs kept us on our toes even if they were all a little uninspired. Helicopters, missiles, bombs, why not build a dragster and track? Who can forget how awesome that was? Nobody? No. Okay, I love that the game wants Wonder Woman finding Green Lantern's body to be this affecting moment, but then it cuts to a shot of him laying there dead in his Green Lantern undies. Sometimes the game feels confused about what kind of emotion it is trying to convey. I think my friends and I all agreed the flash fight was better, but this was still really fun, and it felt like the momentum of the game had really picked up after fighting with Scarlet Speedster and then onto Lantern, instead of all those boring support squad recruitment missions. Wonder Woman. Fit check. Again, no notes. Love this look, perfect level of armour, doesn't just mindlessly copy the Gal Gadot version, I dig the cape and the shoulder plating, yeah, I dig it. My friend Connor has a real hate boner for this outfit, and I don't understand why. Why don't you like this outfit, Connor? Tell the people, why? It makes sense that Wonder Woman is unaffected by Brainiac's mind control, thanks to the lasso of truth but it does feel like a bit of a cop-out for the player. The game promises we can kill the Justice League, and there's only five members in this iteration. Taking one off the board already, and relegating her to cutscenes only seems cheap. It does mean we get a pretty dope Wonder Woman vs Superman battle, but I can't help but feel like it makes our playable heroes feel like window dressing to a bigger story. Diana is the one who has an emotional connection to these people, she doesn't want to fight soups, she has a heartbroken reaction to Barry admitting she must murder them all, her story feels like the most appropriate perspective. Did it need to be that way? Maybe she could have been the last to turn so we got bits of this, but I feel like in the end, she should have been a general in Brainiac's army, and we should have gotten to fight her, just like the rest of the Justice League. Instead of recycling the Flash at the end of the game, wouldn't it have been cooler if Brainiac revealed that he had finally corrupted Diana? We watched her try and save the League across the whole game, and then tragically, she is the last boss that we have to battle. Batman. Fit check. This Batman suit is pretty cool, it's in keeping with the Arkham Knight aesthetic, I think the shoulder pads look a little off, but there's nothing too egregious here. My only complaint is it would have felt more unified to just keep his Arkham Knight costume. There's already so many new looks coming out of this game, and Batman kept his first costume for two games, so why couldn't his Knight look have been preserved? It's a minor gripe. Either the developers missed the bat, or they knew that the player would want to commit ample time to him because he feels like he has a more substantial presence than any other League member. A particular highlight is of course the Batman experience, where you not only take a trip down memory lane, but get a taste of what it was like to be a henchman for all those years in those Predator combat sequences. It's the bat! Later, he hits you with a dose of fear gas, and you end up taking turns fending off the illusions that reference the endgame Joker mission of Arkham Knight. This was fun, especially in co-op as we all watched each other's screens. I got excited by noticing that there was an Arkham-style explosive gel on the wall, and then got blown up by it. I am no better than any henchman in the original games. What I said about this needing to be more story-driven? Yeah, well, imagine if there were more than just two Batman segments, and you got to play levels as well crafted as the Scarecrow stuff in Arkham Asylum. Instead, this is all we get, and then there's a really lame boss fight that's way too easy and doesn't let you use any of your traversal moves. Why restrict the player like this? It would have been way more fun to just rip off the earlier Green Lantern fight and battle a giant fear toxin Batman in a bigger playground with more verticality. In spite of Batman being the only non-meta-human in the Justice League, his loss to the squad feels the silliest because this is the Batman that we got to be for so many years. We took on his whole rogues gallery and saw his toughest battles up close. So to see him lose to Harley Quinn, a character you one-hit counter in a previous game, feels insane. I'm all for character development, but Quinn finishing off the bat in such a blasé manner feels off kilter, but worst of all, it's just boring. This should have been the fight of their lives. This should have felt like a battle they barely walked away from. The way Batman ends up tied up and beaten, only to get a headshot on a bench, makes me believe the whole league is coming back even more so. It's the Stolen Earth principle. There's no way they'd let a character go out like this with so few words in such a rushed manner. Maybe Batman will put the headshot wound into his handy spare hand instead. Superman. Fit check. This costume is so nearly awesome, 
but I think it's way too busy. The red pants feel in line with the panted Batman we got in Asylum and City, but the dark blue patches on his sides don't mesh very well with the rest of the costume. Again, I wish they'd gone simpler, stuck to a nice texture for the fabric, and ditched the needless lines and alternate shades. Still, it's not awful. In the end, the only character I think has a spectacular, spectacular outfit is the Flash. Superman shows up surprisingly little in this game, and I think he stretches credulity the most. What is he doing whilst Task Force X is running around screwing up Brainiac's plans? Just like the Flash, he could find them in a heartbeat and take them out, but he only shows up when a nuke almost hits Brainiac's ship, and then to fight the Princess of Themyscira. I get that maybe Brainiac Superman has too much of an ego to think that the squad could pose a threat, but that's not baked into the writing, and it just feels all too convenient that neither him nor the Flash surprise our team and turn them inside out in seconds. It's crazy that Lois Lane and two Lex Luthers appear in this game, but they never interact with Superman in-game. Don't point to a voice note between them that I didn't discover, because you should demand more from your game, goddammit. Nolan North is a great voice for Superman, but he's two for two with poorly received live service superhero team-up games. Remember, every landing is a chance to make a statement. Mine says, I'm done flying now. Ouch. His boss fight was fun, and again, the weakness for him makes sense, even if wearing the shards makes your team look really stupid. My main gripe with this boss battle is that I think even on normal difficulty it should have posed way more of a challenge. I feel like my mates had found our groove at this point, but it still felt like we smoked that corny boy scout in minutes, and I was expecting it to be a fight we'd have to restart and restart to get it right. It's freaking Superman. So after a string of Justice League battles that were mostly a good bit of fun, it was time to take the fight to Brainiac. Well, one of him. Knowing the campaign was about 8-10 to 10 hours, I knew we wouldn't be taking on all 13 Brainiac multiverse variants before the end of the base game, taking a lot of the wind out of this. It didn't feel like an enthralling climax, but it was cool to travel to another dimension for a different flavour. But this was where me and my mates found the game to be so frustrating, we almost didn't complete it. This section for us was so unbelievably buggy, enemies would freeze and become impervious to damage, or the next mission would fail to trigger, we whittled Flash Brainiac's health down to nothing, and then he disappeared from the map, making it impossible to finish. We'd encountered a couple of glitches in the game previously, but only needed to restart once or twice. This, on the other hand, was an absolute slog, just endlessly and needlessly frustrating, and it meant doing everything in this dimension all over again. By the time we finished it, we were just begging for it to end, and it really, really killed the fun. I hate how meaningless everything feels in the story. These four bad guy B-listers acquired the most powerful upgrades in their lives, took on a superhero team of metahumans, and then defeated one of the most sinister and deadly DC supervillains and they made it look stupidly easy. The game ends in the most basic sense, but it's so obvious that it really is just half the narrative. The game doesn't hang a lantern, no pun intended, on the fact that the Earth has lost its mightiest heroes, or that they killed innocent civilians. It all feels like it's going to get walked back in one of the later seasons of the game, so nobody cares in the now. Story-wise, I can't say I really care that much about seeing the squad take on Brainiac's variants, but I think it will at least lead to some cool new locations, and it will be good to inevitably see the Justice League again. I've seen so many people hoping and praying that when the League return they'll be playable again, but doesn't that dream just prove how much better a straight-up Justice League game would have been? If you're hoping the main superhero team of the title is sidelined for the boss characters, you've got a serious problem. In fact, I felt like as I was playing through the game, there were several different perspectives that would have been more compelling for this story. Wonder Woman, kill the Justice League. Since we know there's a Wonder Woman single player game coming from Monolith, I couldn't help but imagine what this same story would have been like if it had been from Diana's perspective. Wonder Woman has a plethora of weapons and she packs a punch. You could have easily ported a similar style of Arkham Combat to her superhuman strength and it would have been a blast. Add in having her taking on the other four League members and I think you would have got yourself a stew going. I said previously she had a more emotionally wrought perspective on the events that transpire, to the point where it feels kind of like a no-brainer to have her be the central character. Batman, kill the Justice League. But hey, I guess making it a Wonder Woman game would fit the current version of the story, but you'd be playing as someone that wouldn't be too outmatched against these other heroes. It did feel pretty out of character for Batman to go up to Brainiac's ship and allow himself to be taken. Maybe the only place for the Arkham Batman gameplay to go would be seeing the Dark Knight come up with four unique ways to take out these gods. 
It would have been great to see the missing piece of our Arkham Batman story, something that Rocksteady just seemed to have skipped over. The next biggest thing after his identity being revealed and the Joker dying. It would have been great to see our Batman meet the Justice League, get to know them, like them, trust them, and then have to face them. It would have been a huge test since he's always wrestling with the idea of working alone. It would have been a whole other level of nemesis after fighting clowns and exploding penguins. Imagine all the Arkham Batman gameplay staples in a Brainiac controlled metropolis. What's funny is that many years ago following Arkham City, pre-Arkham Knight, rumours swirled about a Silver Age Arkham game that would guest star playable Justice League members. So this could have seen that idea go full circle, I feel like you could get away with just fighting them as Batman, but come on, give us bespoke missions with each of these guys. Imagine unlocking different islands of Metropolis once you've saved a different member and a new Justice League character becomes playable. Four islands would only be one more island from Arkham Knight, meaning you could make the map just as detailed with plenty of interiors and cool level design. The Rocksteady Superman game. It's kind of disheartening to have this big Metropolis sandbox to play in, but no Superman. I think Superman Kill the Justice League wouldn't work nearly as well as it would with Diana or Bruce, since the Man of Steel is far and away the strongest of these gods, but that unicorn of a Rocksteady Superman game could have superseded this entirely and no one would have batted an eye. Imagine that awesome single player Superman game coming out right now instead of this. You could have had Arkham Batman guest star, but also keep it focused on Soup's lore. Lois, Lex, Perry White, Zod, Brainiac, the works. Ugh, I get giddy just thinking about it. Will it ever happen? Who knows. The future of Arkham. Is the Arkham universe dead? Well, I think that question all hinges on two things. The fate of the Justice League and the upcoming content for Suicide Squad post the base game. If the Justice League are truly dead, then this will be one of the biggest butcherings of a beloved character ever. The Arkham Batman going out like a punk alongside the first story to feature Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern and The Flash in this universe would be insane. Too insane. There's no way it's happening. Sefton Hill absent or not, I cannot fathom Rocksteady being that stupid. The Arkhamverse would be Game of Thrones level dead if this sticks. I think in all likelihood we'll be saving League members as we acquire more playable characters in future seasons. We've been promised lots of new story content going forward and new characters all supposedly for free. That is cool, and I definitely think I'll get my buddies back together for a play session or two whenever something new drops, so I can at least see myself playing Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League well into 2024, just for nowhere near as many hours as WB want the average player to commit. Having said that, they don't exactly seem to be doing a good job of enticing us. The first DLC character is going to be Joker, and he looks less Mark Hamill or Heath Ledger, and more Jared Leto, the young, hip, down with the Fortnite kids Joker looks terrible, but at least he might provide some story opportunities for Harley. Maybe she'll detail more of her regrets surrounding her Joker and how she views his and her misdeeds now. It could be ripe for good storytelling, could be, but I don't really care how fluid his combat and traversal is going to be, I simply do not care for playing as the Joker in any game really. He's not a combat character, he's a criminal mastermind, the spider sitting at the edge of the web watching as all the flies get trapped, he's not exactly a warrior, and whilst I love him popping up in just about anything, that's only when he's an antagonist. He doesn't scream playable Suicide Squad member to me. On the plus side, at least the original recipe's Joker's death is going to stick and I suppose giving us this gawky weirdo Joker is an attempt to stray as far from touching that Arkham City ending as possible. Which begs the question, why didn't they just do multiverse deadshot, but whatever. From there it's heavily rumoured that the next couple of characters are Lady Freeze, Deadshot's daughter, and Deathstroke. Let me be the first to say that A, that's f***ing lame, and B, are they trying to intentionally evoke Marvel's Avengers here? Joker and Deadshot's daughter will presumably just be variations on the skill sets of Harley and Deadshot. Wouldn't we all prefer entirely new characters and skill sets? Well, I hear you say. Lady Freeze. Yeah, yeah, what's with the Lady Freeze? I get it's a multiverse, but it's not like I've played as Mr. Freeze so many times that this is a hot and fresh redux. Just give me Mr. Freeze. If you want to put more women in there, why not go with Talia al Ghul or something? Not Lady Freeze. Deathstroke is the only legitimately hype entry, and he's not coming until we've gone through all of these Z-list picks. 
Where's the Suicide Squad A-listers, bro? Honestly, given the mixed reception to the game, they should be putting Deathstroke at the top of the queue. I want Peacemaker, I want Black Manta, I want Katana, I want Killer Croc, I want Slipknot, the man who can climb anything. Most of all, I want goddamn Bloodsport with the best goddamn nanotech ever. But I'll eat my nanotech shoe if they drop him. They ain't giving us Bloodsport, no way. That would be too awesome. Hint, hint, Rocksteady. Hell, if we're going off the beaten path and just doing DC villains, give me Power Armor Lex, Cheetah, Sinestro, Slipknot, the man who can climb anything. Maybe the extra characters will all kick ass and the story DLC will listen to the criticisms of the base game and we'll be looking back on this in a year's time saying they pulled a Battlefront 2. I sincerely hope so. More Batman. Given the relative mauling this game is getting, I would not be surprised if the next Arkhamverse instalment we get is some kind of Batman game. WB playing it as safe as possible. If they do that, one thing I would really want is a different Batman. Let Conroy's incredible goated iteration rest with him, just as Hamill has said he won't come back in honour of this Dark Knight. Give me Damian Wayne or Tim Fox or Terry McGuinness, go futuristic, imagine doing Arkham Knight in a Neo-Gotham, pulling off some Blade run a shit as Batman Beyond. I think we'll see something like that before we see any other League members get their own Arkhamverse experience now, but maybe that will be what is needed to give the audience a palate cleanser. Now if only we were back in the golden age of gaming, I wouldn't have to wait five years plus for this to come to fruition. So all in all, is Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League worth the price tag? I would say no. Even though more content is promised, it can't at this time justify its price point for the amount of content you get. It feels like half a story, and the genuinely really fun gameplay is hampered by the fact that you'll be doing the same objectives over and over again. The most fun to be had is in the boss battles against the Justice League, and if you have to play, it is essential to get a squad of friends together. I don't regret my time on the game, and I had a lot of fun with it as a co-op experience, but there's simply better games out there that could hold your attention in this space for longer that would cost less. I could see there being a redemption of sorts for the game further down the road, if all the story content stays free, and we continue to get exciting characters to play as, and of course, if the Justice League return. The problem is that I don't think this game has killed the Arkhamverse, but it has certainly wounded it. If you could make God bleed, people would cease to believe in heaven. That's what that pillock in Iron Man 2 said. And he's right, because Rocksteady are no longer infallible. They're no longer the gold standard superhero developers of a perfect series of games in this universe. There's this tarnished cousin to the Arkham games that exists, with weird iterations of DC characters, strange story decisions and gameplay that just doesn't hold a candle to what came before. I sincerely think the Arkhamverse will continue past this game and we'll get something great from Rocksteady again. I, and I suspect many others, will have gone from seeing them as a studio that we had complete faith in to a studio we will be cautiously optimistic about. That's a real shame and I don't wish them any ill will. I wish them the best because they brought me a lot of fun times and a lot of great games and I'm sure it's not entirely their fault as you can smell the live service greed coming off this one but it still doesn't change the fact that the final product means I'll think twice the next time we're offered to return to the Arkhamverse. A mahoosive thank you to my latest full fat tier patron, Joseph Maltby. If you'd like to donate money to my Patreon, you can find me at patreon.com slash fullfatvideos. If you'd like to find me on Instagram, you can find me at full underscore fat underscore videos. And if you'd like to find me on Twitter, you can find me at, at fullfatvideos.